Hey everyone, and welcome to Chef AJ Live. I'm your host, Chef AJ, and this is where I introduce you to amazing people like you that are doing great things in the world that I think you should know about. And I love it when I get the scoop of somebody that probably you maybe haven't heard of yet, but I think you will. She is a plant-based doctor in Rhode Island. She's new to me. She was referred by a previous guest on the show, which I love. And she's not only going to be on today telling her story of going from Lisa Simpson to a plant-based doctor, but she's coming back in a few days and bringing two colleagues with her who are plant-based as well. She's going to be telling us her story and doing a granola demo. I'm so excited to introduce you to Dr. Sandra Musil. It's so nice to meet a new plant-based doctor. Thanks for having me, Chef AJ. I'm really yeah. happy to be here. Pleasure. I'm sorry I had to wait, keep you waiting so long. We're trying to improve our booking system so guests don't have to wait four to six months. But I cannot wait to hear your story. And uh, I just, I love it when, because doctors are so smart. And it, it, when they become plant-based, to me, that means they're even smarter. Ah, <laughs> yes. There's not many of us. <laughs> you you would think though that they would at least be plant forward or plant predominant or plant stronger, plant curious, especially in professions, you know, where they are sure that it makes a difference, you know, like cardiology, for example. Right, right. We're getting there. Yeah. Um, is it okay if I share my screen now? Absolutely. I also what what is your specialty, Dr. Musial? I'm actually a pediatrician, but that's no part way. of the story. Um because I'm no longer taking care of children. Oh, wow. So are you able to see the slideshow? I am the slides, but you'll want to change it to slideshow so that we don't see your, uh, you know, your whole thing. So yeah, perfect. Excellent. Okay. Wow. Right. Can't wait to hear so, yes, your my journey from Lisa Simpson to Plant Docs. And I'm going to start back when I was eight years old. <laughs> um, I grew up in the suburb of Massachusetts, and my brother, who was in art, is very interested in agriculture, went to an agricultural high school, decided to raise chickens in our backyard. And we used to get eggs from these chickens, but there was, we named them, and there was this one rooster, Pete, that we had that um, we were sitting around at dinner one night, and um, I was eating, and my family informed me that we were eating peat. <laughs> and I was greatly disturbed by this. And I was crying and upset and refused to eat it. Um, and that was kind of my first um, moment in my life where I connected the food that I was eating with living animals. So um, at the time, nobody in my family was vegetarian. I continued eating meat. I just didn't like to think where it came from. Um, so I prefer, I think most people do, instead of buying what you see on the left that looks very much like peat, to buy chicken that's um, in its packaged form um, with the skin off and the bones removed. It doesn't have a name. And as a child, you don't have a choice. So I kept eating what was being served to me. This is back in the 60s, 70s. And in the late 70s, my uncle Mike died at the age of 50, um, suddenly of an unexpected heart attack. And it was my father's brother, the oldest gentleman in this picture. They were all in World War II at the same time. My dad's on the left. And um, my dad was an engineer, very um, analytical and logical. And he started ordering these um, prevention magazines and reading about nutrition and health and heart attacks because he didn't want to have one. And so we started making changes in my home, like um, no red meat and um, switching off of full fat milk um, and asked my mom to stop frying the um, chicken and baking it instead. So there were the, these changes made in my home that kind of enlightened me to the importance of food and food preparation and health, which led me on my New England tour um, of education. <laughs> I've always lived in New England. And I started at the University of New Hampshire because they had a really great department of nutritional sciences, which wasn't a super common major back then in the 80s. And um, I loved it. And I didn't know what I was going to do with it. I thought I wanted to be a doctor with this bend toward nutrition, but I started thinking maybe I'll be a nutritionist. And after I graduated, um, I didn't like any of the nutritionist jobs. They didn't appeal to me. Um, and I heard of this place called the... Um, Human Nutrition Research Center at Tufts University in Boston. And I thought, ooh, that sounds really cool. So I applied for research jobs there and landed a job in molecular biology research where we were actually doing cancer research. We were dealing with these undifferentiated cells that could become a skeletal cell, could become um, a heart cell, could become um, 
a skin cell. And these particular undifferentiated cells were destined to become fat cells or adipocytes. And we were um, using those in this lab to learn about oncogenes and what turned on and off cancer. Um, so I thought this was just fascinating and decided that I wanted to go to med school. And I went to the University of Massachusetts Med School in Worcester, Mass, and um, fell in love with the pediatric population. And I do remember one particular um, nutrition lecture. There weren't very many back then, um, and unfortunately there still aren't, but there was one where they were talking about um, the, the um, Vietnam War and the boys that had young men who had died. And they were comparing um, post-mortem the arteries in the um, Vietnam boys to the American boys. And the American boys all had early signs of coronary artery disease and fatty streaking in their arteries where the Vietnamese boys that ate mostly plants had these very healthy um, juvenile looking arteries. And this really stuck with me. Um, however, I continued down my path from A to B to C to D on to um, my pediatric residency in Rhode Island. And that's how I um, ended up in Rhode Island. I've never left. We have a population of a little over a million, which is much smaller than LA, <laughs> it's the entire city. Um, but at that time, there were not any specialties in preventative medicine, longevity, anti-aging, East meets West. I was very interested in like acupuncture and Chinese medicine, but there, there was no clear path on, on how to do that. So during my course of my education, I had a couple of revelations. And one was during a lecture in medical school, I was sitting there, it was around 10 a.m. And I had had my grape knots and milk for breakfast, which I always had with berries and orange juice and my coffee with cream. And I would always get like gurgly around 10 a.m. and gassy and a little pain cramping. And I'm sitting in this lecture on lactose intolerance and they're talking about the lactase enzyme, which 68% um, of the population lack. And um, if you don't have the lactase enzyme, you're not able to digest the lactose that's in all dairy products. And suddenly this like light bulb went off in my head that I was lactose intolerant and I couldn't believe I had never put it together before then. And of course, I didn't stop drinking milk because <laughs> there were no lectures in medical school that milk was bad for you. Um, there was no data or science on um, cow's milk leading to inflammation in the body um, and pro um, disease promoting states like um, cancer and heart disease. So I just switched to lactate milk and that seemed like the logical choice at the time. And I carried these lactate pills around with me everywhere I went because I had breakfast, I had dairy at breakfast, lunch and dinner, crazy. So instead of listening to my body and saying, stop drinking milk, I switched to lactate until I learned more in the future. So now I'm in residency, pediatric residency, working ridiculous number of hours. So in my off time, I was watching The Simpsons. <laughs> yes, that's what doctors in training do when they're not working, watching The Simpsons, which if you don't know, it's a cartoon about a mom, dad, and a little girl named Lisa and her annoying brother, Bart. And Lisa is a great role model for children. I could really identify with her. She was intelligent and um, strong-willed. She spoke her mind, she followed her heart. Um, she, um, she really was a role model. And um, as weird as that sounds, she's like this little girl with yellow hair. But they went to this petting zoo and she was playing with this baby lamb and having a great time, cut to dinner, and Marge is serving lamb chops. And Lisa is like, oh my God, I don't want to eat this lamb, and started thinking about where her food came from. And Lisa made the decision, unlike me when with Pete, um, from then on, she wasn't going to eat any meat. She became a vegetarian, Lisa the vegetarian. And um, I was like crying. <laughs> For some reason, this cartoon character that was kind of removed from reality made it easier for me to relate to. And I was like, you know what? If Lisa Simpson can become vegetarian from you know, making this connection, I can too. So I became a vegetarian after watching Lisa Simpson. Um, 
And this is another example. If you haven't seen it, it's a two minute clip called Casa de Carne. And it's about a restaurant named Casa de Carne. You go in and it's beautiful with tablecloths and candlelight and beautiful menus. And you, whatever you order on the menu, like I'll have the ribs, they escort you to this room. And once the door shuts, you're in this stark white room with bright lights and there's a pig there. And in order to get the ribs, they hand you a butcher's knife and you're supposed to kill it. You know, too much for me. I just needed Lisa Simpson, but this was kind of, you know, it, it speaks volumes um, if you watch it. And for me, mammals, um, dogs, cats, I have dogs. It, it just, I didn't see the difference between cows, pigs, um, dogs. So um, that was it for me. I was done eating mammals. And um, however, I did have problems because when I became pregnant with my first child, I found myself craving meat and I wasn't doing it properly. So I was eating kind of a vegan diet, um, but I wasn't a healthy vegan. So I was consuming a lot of white pasta and um, maybe a lot of bread, but I remember not a lot of leafy greens, which you really need for calcium and iron and not a lot of whole grains for the protein and iron and the nutrients in them. Um, so, you know, the, the difference between just, you know, not, I'm not gonna eat meat and really doing it right um, is a very important distinction. But a few years later, everything changed. I um, came across the China study. One of my, I was in primary care practice in pediatrics and one of my patients who was a very intelligent pediatric ICU nurse came in with her children and said, have you read the China study? My doctor told me to read it and told me to stop giving milk to my children. And I was like, oh no, <laughs> like at first I thought this isn't true. And this, you know, it's just some wackadoodle kind of side thing, but it, it um, piqued my interest and I took a deeper dive because I'm just fascinated by nutrition. And I felt like I need, I want to find out more. I got the China study, I read it and it started me down this very important journey that's led me to where I am today. So um, I give full credit to um, the China study. Um, it was a large population, largest population study ever done when China realized there were these huge discrepancies between heart disease and cancer rates between the countryside people and the people in the city. And they wanted to research and they hired um, T. Colin Campbell. They collaborated with him. And it was a multi-year, very long study in looking at um, detailed biomarkers and um, histories of the people that lived in the different provinces in China. And the bottom line was that the people who lived in the country and some of the poorest people were eating whole real foods, you know, grains, um, fruits and vegetables, and they weren't eating processed foods, fast foods, they weren't eating dairy, and they weren't eating meat. Um, and they had the lowest even non existent rates of heart disease and cancer. So if you haven't read it, it, it was mind changing for me. And then I came across um, Prevent and Reverse Heart Disease by Caldwell Esselstyn. And um, he did this multi-year study um, taking patients that were cardiac patients that had maxed out on their medical intervention. No more surgeries could be done. They're maxed out on their meds. They were you know, given a few months to a year to live. And he said, send them my way. I'm gonna put them on this whole food plant-based diet, no oils, and they lived for decades. So these, to um, Ann Ann are my mentors, my original kind of teachers of the whole food plant-based um, lifestyle. Ann and um, Caldwell on the top and T. Colin Campbell's on the bottom. And within that same year that this was all coming to light, I saw that the three of them were gonna be giving this full weekend retreat at Kripalu, which is this wonderful yoga retreat in Western Mass in the Berkshires. So I brought my father-in-law, my sister, my niece, and that was the weekend that really solidified it, not just for me, but for all four of us. Um, this is my um, father-in-law. Um, he was about 78 when we went there together, and now he's 88. And when we go, when we travel together at the airport, they're always like, "Sir, sir, take off your shoes and belt." You, you know, he's like, "I'm over 70. I'm 88." And they're like, "No, you're not." You know, he's doing amazing, and he's been following this strictly. My first. Um, patient where, who I convinced to do this on my own was my brother. Um, I sent the China study to everyone, all my family members. And this was my brother on the left before. Um, 
he read the book and it was just perfect timing for him because his neighbor had recently died of a heart attack. He was told by his doctor that he needed to go on an antihypertensive for high blood pressure. He needed to lose weight. He needed to go on cholesterol meds. And he was like, I don't want to. And then here, my sister sends me this book and he's like, okay. And he went from being a meat and potatoes guy, pretty inactive to um, being my biggest fan and um, you know, tells everyone, everyone's like, how do you do it? Why do you look so good? But from January, I gave him the book for Christmas in December. And from January to August, he lost 50 pounds. His cholesterol dropped. It was really the LDL. That's the risk factor for heart attacks. And he went from 120 to 56, which Caldwell Assistin says you're virtually heart attack proof when you get under 70. And he normalized his blood pressure just with food. No, he never went on any of the meds. And he went from being out of breath just kind of walking out to the mailbox to being an avid biker, skier. And he just did six weeks on the um, Colorado trail from like Denver to Durango or something like that. And I flew out and hiked for one day with him. I could not keep up with him. Um, I was blaming it on the altitude, but who knows. So things were coming full circle for me in my career and my life from Pete, where it just didn't feel like right to eat animals to eating and drinking dairy makes me sick to eating animals leads to poor health. And this is you know, being well-documented. Veganism is best for our earth. That's a whole nother talk. I'm not gonna eat animals anymore. So from the time at Kripalu um, in reading the China study, I've, I've been um, whole food plant-based with no oils. And finally, kind of my, my values that, that I've had all along since I was born, my love for animals and not wanting animals to be mistreated um, and the importance of food and health um, are, are one. And the only thing was I was kind of stuck in this pediatric field and I was feeling this drive, this, that, this like pull that I really wanted to treat adults and help adults reverse these conditions that they think are irreversible. Um, so I switched my job around the same time in 2010 from being 13 years in pri primary care um, pediatric practice to back where I was trained at Hasbro Children's Hospital in Providence, Rhode Island, as a teacher of um, pediatric residents and medical students at Brown University, because I felt like maybe instead of just one at a time educating, I can educate um, the future doctors. And I was definitely known as um, a veggie pusher. <laughs> I was a breastfeeding advocate. I had become a lactation consultant when I was in primary care. Um, some of the things that we, we educated our families on is you know, to eat the rainbow, tell it it's kind of a fun way to eat your fruits and vegetables. Um, the importance of home cooked meals and sitting down with the family at dinner time and um, limiting or e eliminating juice and SSBs, which are sugar sweetened beverages. And these concepts are all evidence-based driven. There are studies behind them that show children knowing this results in healthier children with healthier BMIs. So together with one of my colleagues, Dr. Corcoran, we both became board certified in obesity medicine and opened up um, an obesity clinic for children at Hasbro Children's Hospital called the Health Clinic, which stood for Healthy Eating Active Living Through Hasbro. And she created a bunch of um, modules over different times. So kids would come in like every other week or every month, a lot, a lot more than like a primary care doctor could see them. Um, and they would learn a different lesson each time. And we also incorporated exercise. I had this floor piano that I would pull into the room and the little kids could, you know, play music and get exercise, would go outside and play um, basketball. We had sticker charts where they could bring these home and try to encourage them to eat five fruits and vegetables um, every day. And they put a sticker every time they ate one. I started a vegetable garden at Hasbro Children's Hospital. This is right outside the doors of the clinic. And I, there were six beds and each bed was a different color of the rainbow. And the message was, did you eat the rainbow today? When they came out, they would see the sign. So for example, in the red bed, we had red tomatoes and flowers and red ribbons and a red sign. And in the orange bed, we grew little mini pumpkins and carrots. Um, here are one of my colleagues' children planting the yellow bed. Those are baby corn. And on the right, you see a, few, a couple months later, this mature corn. 
And the sign says yellow vegetables like summer squash and corn are good for your skin, immune system, and digestion. Why am I yellow? Lutein and carotenoids. So it was like educational and inspiring. And this was an inner city population. And a lot of kids have never seen where vegetables come from or how they grow. So the hope was that this would inspire them to maybe have their own backyard garden or to eat more vegetables at home. We also did this project with every sugary drink bottle I could come across. I would, um, my kids helped me do this, put, put the sugar in um, within the amount that it actually had. So for example, this 10 ounce bottle of Fanta soda contains 81 grams of sugar, but to many people who don't know what that means, it's meaningless, but people know teaspoons. So if you take 81 and divide it by um, four, you get 20 teaspoons. And so when you tell a parent, this has 20 teaspoons of sugar, um, it, it means something. But then when they hold that bottle and shake it and look at the sugar, it's like, wow, I, I had no idea. So this was um, a tool that we used throughout the clinic to educate um, folks on sugar, sugary beverages. And this kind of led to some publications that I did with my colleague and friend, Natalia Golova. Over many years, we did um, the gold standard of um, medical studies, which is a, a randomized control trial. And we had two big groups where we took um, one group and um, they got this intervention. And our intervention was we made these um, vignette videos in English and Spanish. And we had multiple handouts about um, the adverse effects of um, drinking sugary beverages and juice. Um, and so one group got the intervention starting at two months of age. So this is talking, you know, prevention, not waiting until they already love juice when they're like one and a half or two. We wanted the parents to not give it at all ever. So we did it at two months, four months, six months, a year, and um, we followed them for three years. And what it showed was that the intervention group had um, a change in their knowledge scores. So they learned from having our intervention compared to the um, control group. However, it didn't change behavior and it didn't change the BMI outcomes three years later. So behavior is hard to change. We all kind of know that, right? So during this kind of last 10 year period as a pediatrician, I was really hungry for more knowledge. I read the China study and I was like, I wanna read more, you know, I wanna learn more and read more about like real science. I don't want it just to be an opinion. I want it to be, evidence-based, MD quality level. I don't wanna be some kooky doctor that's gone vegan <laughs> you know, without really having the um, data behind it. So I started at um, eCornell, had this plant-based nutrition certificate. I did um, years and years ago now. Um, that was the first thing I ever did. And then I found this Institute of Integrative Nutrition in New York City that had this year long program of health coaching. So I became a health coach and learned a lot about um, it was very motivating for me to kind of empower myself to maybe go my own way because I was starting to think about this. I attended the American College of Lifestyle Medicine conferences, which what I was like, finally, my tribe, these are my people as a bunch of MDs that were super passionate about the evidence and the data behind lifestyle changes like diet, nutrition, exercise, meditation, mindfulness, sleep. These are all important um, pillars of lifestyle medicine. And then I did the American Board of Obesity Medicine um, board certification, which is about 80% adult medicine. So I felt like, okay, here we go. I'm getting a little, you know, clout here with the adult population. Maybe this is going to give me what I need to um, transfer over to the adult world. And last year I did this culinary coaching because I want, I really want to incorporate cooking. I'm not a chef, I'm a doctor, but everyone eats and everyone needs to cook. So I just wanna teach people to cook and that it doesn't have to be difficult or intimidating. But what I learned at, at Hasbro is so many of these parents just really didn't know how to cook. Um, they were raised by parents who didn't cook. So, and now we're the next generation. So there, you know, people need to learn to cook again. Um, so that was a great program. And on the side, I was doing a medical consultant for a wellness company in New England called Simplify. And they got this contract with Babson College, which is a business school in Massachusetts for the employees 
to give three different nutrition lectures on the most common complaints and of the employees. And the three most common complaints were heart issues like um, heart disease, hyper, hypertension, which is high blood pressure, high cholesterol, musculoskeletal pain, like um, back pain and inflammation. And the third one was cancer prevention or people that have had a cancer diagnosis. So I went and did all this research. So I have three different nutrition um, lectures on which foods people should eat for these three different conditions. And this like magical moment, I think in my kind of process and journey was that it wasn't different. <laughs> the, the foods that help all three of these things were the same. It, it was a great moment for me because I was like, this is really simple. <laughs> a whole food plant-based diet with no extra sugar, oil, and salt is the optimal food for the human body. And, and more and more research is just um, coming out in the last 10 years that keeps backing this up for all these conditions. A whole food plant-based diet has been shown to prevent, improve, or even reverse these conditions. So, if you're, I like to think of it, if you're eating healthy, if you're eating the fuel your body needs to fuel the cells, to give them maximum um, functioning capability, and you're feeding the trillions of bacteria in your gut what it needs to be the most diverse and healthy gut biome you can have, you don't get these things. That's the, that should be the default, right? Instead of we're eating this Western diet full of processed foods, unhealthy fats and refined flours, too much sugar. And we're getting all these diseases. Now everyone who hits middle age expects to get these disease. And um, it shouldn't have to be that way. I feel like um, the medical um, community and establishment needs to take a major shift and where they're at right now is all about the pharmaceutical companies, the surgeries, the interventions. And um, there is not enough focus on food as medicine, preventative medicine, and telling patients about this. Frankly, I feel like it's malpractice for a doctor to have a patient in their office with heart disease or type two diabetes or cancer and not tell them that the, the food that they're eating could be worsening their condition or the food they're eating could actually help their condition. This is something that every doctor needs to be informed about and disclose to their patients. So I decided this is what I wanna do and I, I gotta figure out how to do it. So back to little old Rhode Island, which one of the wonderful things about it is how people cross paths and the networking. It's like, um, you know, if LA is like 3.8 million, million, that's where you are, I looked it up. Um, <laughs> Rhode Island is this um, little state where a lot of people know each other. And I was at a wedding and I met an amazing woman who's become a mentor and a role model for me named um, Kim Anderson. And we started chatting and I was telling her about the garden I just started at Hasbro. And she was telling me about um, forks over knives that she had watched and what the health and that um, her and her family, her children and her husband, they all wanted to kind of commit to moving the needle in Rhode Island to better awareness about the importance of whole food, plant-based eating, not just for health, but for um, the earth. Um, and I ran into her a little while later and you know, we stayed in touch and she said, I am opening the world's first plant-based food hall <laughs> in Rhode Island. And I was like, oh my God, like this is too good to be true. And she's like, it's gonna have four restaurants, a marketplace, a coffee bar. It has um, kombucha on tap. And there's gonna be this community space in the basement where she wanted to um, run programs. And she thought that maybe I could run some kind of jump starts where I educate people and do labs before and after. And I was so excited for this opportunity and thought I, I'm gonna figure out how to do this. And this is how um, Plant Docs was born which is my company um, with the tagline, Real Foods Heal. And I started, this is before Plant City opened. I was like, I, I wanna have something on board when Plant City opens July 1st, 2019. And I recruited um, and found Dr. Steven Stein and Dr. Suyin Lee, who are my two fellow plant docs. 
And they were on board with um, starting this company with me and creating this jumpstart and teaching patients. They're both board certified family medicine doctors. So they're very versed in treating adults, excuse me. And I felt like together, the three of us, um, it's gonna be great. So we started these programs called Jumpstart Your Health in the cellar of Plant City. And this is the cellar. And there's um, quotes on the wall from you know, famous whole food plant-based gurus. These are a lot of the, the books that I love that I refer um, to our patients. We have um, a place for PowerPoint presentations and cooking demonstrations. And one of our favorite quotes that's on the wall there is the food that you eat um, can either be the safest and most powerful form of medicine or the slowest form of poison, which I alluded to before. It's by Ann Wigmore. And this is what I start with on every class that I do, because this is the message that people need to hear. So when you eat, when one eats, you're at a fork in the road with your fork and you need to decide what is the quality of the food that you're eating? Is it health promoting food that is optimizing your health and your cells and making your body work the best way it can so it can heal itself and you feel great? Or is what you're eating promoting disease states and inflammation? And we just need to educate people because at this point, when people go to the doctor, it seems like everyone's just lining up in the pills and surgery line and nobody's in that lifestyle change line. So I try to educate people that there's a choice instead of pills and or surgery that one can choose healthy, nourishing, healing foods. And I want everyone to switch over to the lifestyle change line. So that's um, part of the mission of Plant Job Docs. During COVID, um, I had a lot of thinking um, as everyone was kind of hibernating. We were wearing our N95s all the time at work. I decided to take a leap of faith and quit my job. So last, about a year ago, I started devoting all my time to plant docs. I changed it from an LLC to a nonprofit because I feel like um, that's just more in alignment with my values and the value, um, the mission of the, the um, company. And I'm just gonna go over some ways and things that um, plant docs do, what some of the, um, our programs. So our signature program is what I talked about before. It's called Jumpstart Your Health. And we, we take 20 to 40 people at a time. It's um, one month long. So we meet once a week um, over Zoom or in person. And it's a lot about education, menu planning, reading labels, what to shop for, how am I gonna get enough protein, um, how to maximize your calcium and iron if you're giving up you know, milk and meat, um, and make sure people are doing it right and people doing it in a healthy way. And we, do, we have one-on-one -on -one, um, consultations after the program to go over their after blood work. We're seeing dramatic results in LDLs dropping, reversing diabetes. It is the most rewarding thing I've ever done in my life. Um, and the two other doctors are still in their regular day jobs. And they're just saying, you know, the results we have in this program are so much better than what they have at the office by giving lisinopril or, um, you know, a statin if people, you know, are on board with this. So on Wednesday, um, August 31st, the three of us are gonna be on Chef AJ talking um, about our results and more in detail about the program. But we do have a fully remote program coming up in September that anyone can join. And in October, we have our traditional hybrid, which is um, part in-person, part remote, or people can choose to do it all remote. So we're gonna have 20 remote slots and 20 hybrid slots. The other thing that I started um, doing after um, I was, I've been doing this full time was I, I was approached by the Gloria Gemma Breast Cancer Research Resource Foundation in Rhode Island to create a program for breast cancer survivors. And um, so I spent a month last year just researching cancer and food and nutrition and came up with a six week program that um, it was live in person at Plant City and it was sponsored by Kim um, at Plant City. And these breast cancer survivors came and there was some community bonding um, part like for the first 10 minutes. And then I would give like a 20, 
25 minute lecture on a particular food item that has particular um, anti-cancer attributes um, like mushrooms, for example. So like one week, I would talk about mushrooms and the different phytochemicals and what's found in mushrooms that are unique and make them really anti-cancer. And then I would do a cooking demo and sometimes they'd help me, but we made like, we would drink mushroom tea there and we would make um, mushroom, um, we made like a stroganoff that was delicious. And then we would be like a little tasting everyone would um, eat together. And um, it was really great. We also did like another week was on cruciferous vegetables. And I brought um, a friend of mine, um, Rich Wolf works at um, the um, Jonathan Sprouts and he gave up sprouts out to all the women and we made little kits so everyone could grow their own broccoli sprouts. Um, it was really fun. So this, I decided this fall, I'm gonna um, do something similar again, but have it be all remote because something happened during COVID. We switched in our jump starts from having these live cooking demonstrations to having people cook in their own kitchen. And I found it superior because instead of just watching us cook, they had to go buy the miso, go buy the tahini and actually you know, play with it in their own kitchen. And then they would actually cook with it when they learned how to cook with it. So people were empowered when, they, when they're doing the own, their own um, cooking. So with this um, cancer class, it's called Jumpstart Your Health for Cancer Survivors. It's gonna be a five week class in um, October to learn about the most powerful anti-cancer foods and um, and learn to do a simple dish with them. And I watched um, Christy Funk this week on your show um, and there was a lot of you know, overlap, she was great. Um, I also have a cooking class that I do once a month online that anyone can join over Zoom to learn um, the gifts that every ingredient in what we cook with is um, a gift for your body. It, it, it's giving your body something good and that's how it should be, right? Everything we eat should be something that makes you healthier and feel better. Um, and it's fun. And when you're done, you have dinner. So um, I love doing those. I also have private consultations that I do um, remotely or um, at Plant City. That can be one time or a group of five, or I do, I've done a private jumpstart um, as well. So here's how people can contact me. My website is Plant Docs PVD. And PVD is short for Providence. It's what our airport's called, you know, the three letters. Um, because when I was starting this, I was thinking, oh, maybe someday there'll be a Plant Docs NYC and a Plant Docs LAX. Um, but anyway, we're plantdocspvd.com. And that's also our handle on social media, Instagram, Facebook. And my, I have a YouTube channel that I'm just starting. So I just have a few things on it, but it's called Plant Docs. Not to be confused with the guy who diagnoses and treats plants, who's also Plant Docs. <laughs> um, so... What I wanted to do today for um, a quick cooking demo is um, how to make homemade granola. And the reason I chose this is I wanted to demystify it. Um, the store-bought granola is unhealthy. It's full of fat and sugar. And um, when you get a really good one, like at my coffee shop down the road, a little bag this big is like $7. And I make a batch that's like this big. <laughs> and it's not that hard. And I'm gonna show you my shortcuts, how I make it in um, a short amount of time. And if you um, miss it or wanna watch it again, I have it on my YouTube channel. So that's Plant Docs and it's under Dr. Sandy's Granola. So um, to start, can so. I just say what a fabulous presentation this was? And I'm so yeah. happy. I love hearing people's stories in general, but especially when it causes them to do something that's going to help so many other people. So thank you for sharing that wonderful short story of how you transitioned, because that that was that's always my question anyway. So you actually did it in a PowerPoint. Thank you. Yeah. And and it's funny that you mentioned granola because like that's like I, I, I'm curious if you cook it in the oven because I do mine in the dehydrator and it doesn't take very long and it, it stays crisp like forever. Wow. No, I don't have a dehydrator. I don't have a lot of toys in my kitchen. Um, I don't know why. I just like to do stuff by hand in the old fashioned way. But yeah. um, I, um, so to, to sum it up, there's wet ingredients and then there's dry ingredients. And if you want to make super simple granola, you could just do rolled oats and put some juice in it and toast it. And that could be called granola. Mine has a lot more ingredients that um, 
I think you're going to share with everyone, right? Uh, yes, I couldn't actually cut and paste it because of the way it was. But if you send it to me like as a PDF, then I can cut and paste it and put okay. it in the show notes. Um, so I'm going to move my camera down so you can see what I'm doing. But um, so in, so I have the wet ingredients, the dry ingredients, and then I have my dried fruit that I add afterwards. So we're just going to start with um, toasted coconut, which you could totally leave out. But um, I'm going to take this is um, a dehydrated, unsweetened, shredded coconut. So it's lower in fat. It's organic. And I just like the flavor that it gives to the granola. It also plays an important role in the dried fruit, which you will see. So I do a quarter cup of the coconut and I toast it in the oven that I've preheated for my granola, same temperature. And it only takes about four to seven minutes. I'm just gonna pretend, but we'll put it in here. And when it's done, it looks like this. It turns a caramel color um, and it's very fragrant and delicious. So I have that. So then while that's toasting, I do my wet ingredients. And for sake of time, I've already done the first step, which is taking one cup of apple cider, but you could use any juice. I've used pomegranate juice, dark cherry juice. I've used orange juice, but I love the flavor of the apple cider. And another shortcut is I get a gallon of apple cider. I put one cup aliquots and baggies and freeze them all. And then when I'm ready to make my granola, I just dump out um, my frozen block of one cup of apple cider and I reduce it by a half. So this is already reduced. You, you, what word did you just say? Alicot? I did. Oh, sorry. That's like a medical term. Alicot. Oh gosh. Yeah. Cause you know, you got to understand we're, we're, we're just lay people. Here. So <laughs> I had no <laughs> idea. I'm thinking, is that a new fruit? Like an apricot? Yeah, that's yeah. funny. That's so funny. Sorry. One cup portions. It's the, okay. it's a fancy word for portion. <gasps> All right. Got to speak English here. <laughs> yeah. right. Sorry about that. All right. So <laughs> okay. I add, um, and I don't measure things. Um, I add a teaspoon of cinnamon and cinnamon has a lot of anti-infective and antioxidant properties. I love cinnamon. I put it in a lot of things. Um, I always thought spices were just for flavoring. This is nutmeg, but I am so happy to learn that they have, you know, so many wonderful qualities and phytonutrients and nutritional benefits, especially turmeric's my favorite. Um, a teaspoon of vanilla. And if you have high blood pressure, don't add the salt, but I add a little bit of salt. And I add a quarter cup for a sweetener of um, maple syrup. You could also use um, honey or date syrup is one of my favorite sweeteners. I love date syrup, but no, most, a lot of people watching it like me are ethical vegans. So we wouldn't, we'd be using honey, but they do make a bee free honey. They do make a vegan honey now. How is that? I haven't tasted it. Cause the only sweetener I use is dates. And I think date syrup is such a great sweetener. There's no reason to use anything else. But how do you make uh, a honey without the bees? Well, that's that. I, I don't think it's actually, I, I, I'll look it up while you're cooking. But what I'm saying is if it, it, it apparently it has the taste of honey, I will look it up and answer that question for you. Oh, oh, I see. It's not actual honey. No, no. But they call it bee free honey, you know, that's so. Interesting. Well, so now I'm going to do my dry ingredients. And this is my other shortcut crazy thing. And it's because I have this long-term love affair with granola, but I have a basket that says granola and literally everything um, is in this basket. And so I don't have to go searching for all the ingredients and say, oh, I'm going to forget that, this or that. It's just all in my basket. I'm going to add four cups of oats. And I use organic rolled oats. I try to use organic whenever possible. Um, you, you know, um, just to let you know, I, I Googled it and apparently bee free honey is made from apples and it was a shark tank success story. That's all I know right now. So I haven't tasted it, but it, now I'm intrigued and maybe should have the person on the show. Are you old enough to remember Quaker well, it may, maybe they still have it, but I, I really think it was around 1970 when it came out, granola, 
in the supermarket and it was called Quaker 100% natural. And it was these clusters and they were, it was like the most delicious thing. But like you said, the ingredients were brown sugar and white sugar and all, I mean, it just like chemicals and things, but it was so good. So I'm going to add a cup of flake cereal. And um, I like this Nature's Path Heritage Flakes, um, but you could use any flake cereal. I just like the texture it gives to it. So it's an all not oats. There's like this other texture within it. I'm going to add sliced almonds. Um, and it calls for three quarters of a cup. You can add other nuts, but I found I've experimented. And when you use like walnuts and pecans, they tend to burn. So you should add them in the last probably 10 minutes. So they just toast that they don't get overcooked. And then my other favorite ingredient is um, pumpkin seeds. I'm gonna add a half a cup of pumpkin seeds. They're a great source of magnesium. And then I love to load up the flax seed. I think the recipe I shared with you is um, a quarter cup, but um, I often add a half cup. And I tell all my participants, according to um, you know, research, flax, ground flax seed is shown to help so many things, glucose control, lowering your LDL, um, anti-cancer. It's just goodness with all the omega-3 fatty acids in it. I keep it in the freezer, not my basket, um, because of the shelf life. Um, but I love adding it wherever I can. So those are my dry ingredients. So then you take your wet ingredients and just dump it on and mix it up. And once it's combined and the oats are saturated, I cook it on two different cookie sheet trays and I bake it at um, 300 degrees for about 40 minutes. And every about 15 minutes, I move it around because if you don't, um, sometimes the pieces on the edge burn. So this looks pretty good. It's pretty saturated. This guy's to remind me to smile. <laughs> um, so I'm gonna put half of it on a cookie sheet just so you can see, super easy. Like the whole process was not taken. And spread it out so it will toast properly. And I just give it a shake so it moves around. That's it, I pop it in the oven. And then while this is baking, I do my dried fruit component of this. So you can use any dried fruit you like. I've changed over the years. I used to like figs. And this was something interesting I learned at Plant City. A lot of people consider figs not vegan. Did you know about that? Well, it's something about the, like the wasp is, the, I, I heard something about it and it's made me not want to eat figs anymore. So. <laughs> yeah. And it, I think it's pretty rare the way most figs are self-pollinating anyway in the United States. So don't require the wasp at all. These are dried cherries, by the way, my new favorite um, dried fruit for this. Half, I want one and a half cups total. So half cup of each, but some figs, um, if the wasps are confused or whatever, they can pollinate the wrong thing and end up inside the fig um, in theory, like parts of it. So yeah, that freaked me out. And that's, and I, I used to love figs, especially when I go to Rancho La Puerta, the fresh figs and dried figs. But ever since my friend Sharon told me that I can't eat them anymore. Cause I, <laughs> it, it's not even just because I'm an ethical vegan. It just sounded disgusting to me. And it's like certain things in life you don't want to know. Like, for example, well, I don't eat chocolate anymore, but a lot of chocolate had like this, like a beetle in it, like the shellac of a beetle. I, I mean, it's just so weird what they do with food. Yeah. Um, so these are unsulfurated dried apricots, which I love. They stay soft. Um, the figs, the other problem with the figs was I felt like they got dried out a lot in this um, recipe. So I did a third cup of dried cherries, a third cup of apricots, and then I'm just going to do some dates, which I love too. And, um, and then next is where the coconut comes in. Because what happens is when you put all this dried fruit together in a bowl, 
it all sticks together. It's all very sticky. I'm gonna show you. Take these chocos. And then I take my toasted coconut, quarter cup, and I sprinkle it in there. And then I use my hands because I can feel. And I'm coating my dried fruit with the toasted coconut and separating where I feel like they're stuck together, I'm separating them. And so what it does is it prevents clumping of the dried fruit in the granola. So when the granola is done after 40 minutes, I have a batch that I made earlier and it's cooled completely. It should turn this kind of golden brown. I put in my dried fruit. Mix it up and then that's it. And I store it in this um, airtight container. And it, it la I usually use it within a week, two at the most. That's it. That's my, my cooking demo. That is fantastic. Why do we love crunchy? Well, not everyone, but why do so many of us love crunchy food so much? The crunchier, the better. I get tired of the oatmeal and I like the crunch. Yeah. You, you can hear me okay, right? I can. Oh, perfect. No, it's just so, I just, I love crunchy food. It's uh, my TMJ doesn't love it, but there's something so satisfying about things that are crunchy. Yeah, I agree. And I usually have it with a cup of fresh fruit, fresh berries, like, um, Blueberries, strawberries, raspberries, blackberries. I do a combination of those with, um, I like unsweetened almond milk or oat milk. Yeah, I love it. I love it with almond milk and strawberries. There's nothing I like more. I, I think of it more as a dessert, so I don't really eat it for breakfast, but after lunch, I'll, I often have a little bit of my carrot cake granola with almond milk and strawberries. It's so satisfying. Yeah, I love it. So all your programs sound wonderful. I've linked to them below in the show notes. Do people have to live in your state to, to have a virtual consultation or because you're also a health coach, they can live anywhere. Yeah, they can live anywhere. And we just agree on um, a time to meet. And I'm very flexible with that because it's kind of new for me. So <laughs> I'm still working out when I'm doing what, but yeah. That's fantastic. Well, it's such a pleasure to meet you. And I look forward to you coming back with your two colleagues. So we, we get a three for yeah, we're gonna do a little cooking demonstration. We're gonna, um, our signature dish is called any bean, any green, any grain. Um, and it's a simple plant-based recipe that's oil-free. Um, that's kind of for, you know, beginners that don't really know how to complete the plate and have a, a full um, healthy meal that's balanced with everything you need. Um, but this does it without, um, makes it simple. That's great. Oh, there's a question from a live viewer about coconut. Coconut is high in, where did it go? Coconut is high in fat. Is there another option for keeping the dried fruit separate? The, uh, Dr. Musil, did you know they have a, like a defatted coconut? And that's what I use where it's about like 66% less fat. You can get yeah. a fatted that, coconut. This says um, reduced fat. And when I was reading the back, it says it's dehydrated coconut. So it is much lower fat than regular coconut. They squeeze the fat out um, and dehydrate it. So, um, but if someone wanted to avoid it, um, you know, what you could use to keep the, maybe just like you could grind up, um, use like oat flour, um, grind up some oats yourself or use oat flour and just use that um, or any plant-based flour, chickpea flour would probably work just fine. Nice. Well, maybe you'll go into business and start selling it. <laughs> yeah, it's delicious. That's why it was such a gr so great meeting. I look forward to having you back very soon, which is actually, let's see, you're scheduled for Wednesday, the last day of the month with your team. So that's going to be fabulous. I hope everyone will come back. Yes. And if you get me that recipe, I'll put it in the show notes. You sent it in a way that like I could download it, but I couldn't get it quite in. So just I'm sure yeah. people would love to have that. So thank you so much. It was really a pleasure meeting you. Yeah, it's very nice to meet you too. Thanks for having Thanks me Thanks so much, Dr. Musial. And thanks all of you for watching another episode of Chef AJ Live. Please come back tomorrow when we'll have another fabulous cooking demo from Laura Ann's Jam. It is completely sugar-free and she will be introducing a new flavor. Take care.